On this week's episode of Work Trends, we're talking about how to shift the way we treat people at work with author Kimberly White. Welcome to the Work Trends podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Biro. Every week, I interview interesting people and brands who are reimagining work. For more information, be sure to check us out at talentculture.com and join us live on Twitter every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern using the hashtag WorkTrends. Today's guest is Kimberly White. She's the author of a new book out this summer, The Shift, How Seeing People as People Changes Everything. Welcome to Work Trends, Kimberly. Thank you so much, Megan. I'm so glad to be here. Happy summer. Thank you. And to you, our, I live in the Midwest. We've had this horrible heat wave, but it is starting to fade. I was just in Denver, which I guess doesn't really count as the Midwest, but we had the heat there too. And it's pretty much everywhere. But you know what? Yeah. I'm not going to complain. I don't know about you, but I feel like I just want summer to last forever. I agree. Maybe not the 100 plus degree summer, but I'm in no hurry to get back to winter. Where do you hail from? Well, I think of myself as being from New York. I lived most of my adult life in Manhattan, but we recently moved to central Illinois, small farm town called Pawnee. Yeah, I haven't, I don't quite feel like I'm from here yet, but this is where I live and I really, really enjoy it. What led you there? Well, a couple of things. The first thing was just being priced out of Manhattan. It was just crazy. It just got to be too expensive for us. And we had a friend who lived in this small farm town who owned an apartment and just said, hey, why don't you stop by? I can give you a great deal while you're transitioning. But then once we got here, we enjoyed it so much. We just couldn't think of a reason to go anywhere else. You know, if you're looking for a place where you can be happy and your kids can be happy, we thought we found it. Why, why roll the dice and try something else? So we just stayed. Love it. Hey, if you're out there listening to us, utilize the hashtag work trends. We'd love to hear from you. Where do you live right now? And are you enjoying summer? So listen, uh, Kimberly, you wrote a book about how one organization has created a really successful business and a great place to work. But I know that's not what you initially set out to do. So tell us, how did you decide to write this book? Yeah, it was crazy. So first of all, I didn't really decide to write it. I uh, am a freelance writer. And that's a a tough business to break into. So I was just doing whatever I could, you know, to follow my dream and break into the business, really. And I got offered a job writing about a healthcare company based in California. And they, they chose me partially because when I was in college, I used to work for a consulting company. It's called the Arbinger Institute. Some of your listeners have probably heard of it. They're very successful. Yes. So one of their former employees had actually started this healthcare company and things were going very well. They were doing some very interesting things there and he thought it would make a great book. And he was thinking maybe a book just for his own employees. He wasn't sure, but he wanted to sort of capture what they were doing and have a record of it. And he wanted somebody who was familiar with the Arbinger Institute. And so and so I got this job basically on the strength of my sort of business and philosophical background. I didn't know at all what the company actually did. I had taken the job before I realized that what they did was they run nursing homes. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, I'd been in nursing homes a little bit when I was younger, you know, singing Christmas carols and stuff. And I hadn't loved it. And, uh, you know, and I, it seemed like a depressing kind of environment, but I thought that was okay for the purpose of the book. I was just going to hang out with the executives and, you know, sort of do the, the philosophical business process type a sort of thing <laughs> and, you know that was uh, yeah, as i'm as i'm laughing over here going but is that really possible yeah so that was one of the first things they told me they said you have to go into one of these buildings you have to see what we really do because you can't understand what we're doing at the sort of corporate executive level without knowing what we produce you know what we do where the money comes from what the point is so they sent me they told me to buy scrubs and go into one of these facilities. And I just, I was so clueless. I was so clueless, Megan, I cannot even tell you. And I went in and I thought, you know, the the administrator of the building, sort of the boss of the building, asked me what I'd like to do. And I just couldn't even think of what I wanted to see. It was just a nursing home, you know? So they ended up putting me with a wound nurse who was going around like checking on and healing up bed sores and surgical wounds, because that honestly sounded Mm -hmm. more palatable to me than just talking to the patients. You know, at least I had a wound to look at. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and you're all- and you are revealing about your personality right now, which I find fascinating. And we'll oh. get into that later. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I'm just I'm yeah. terrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's you know it's embarrassing. Yeah. Well, no, it's now, not embarrassing. It's just, you're just being true to yourself. You know yourself, yeah. right? And, and a lot of people are like this about nursing homes too, I think. Just kind of like. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, right. But when I got in there, I was just astonished because this nurse, Lauren, was amazing. She wasn't only a skilled nurse, but she loved her patients so much. And she would say, hey, gorgeous, how are you doing, darling? She just greeted them with all of this delight that was not, it was not fake. She wasn't doing it so they would like her or anything. She was just really happy to see them. And she would tell me about their personalities and tell me about their lives. And I was just, I thought, my goodness, who is this woman? What makes her so incredible? But then I hung out with another nurse and a nurse's assistant and a housekeeper. And all of these people were the same. They were happy. They loved their jobs. They loved their coworkers. And above all, they loved the patients. They loved the people they worked with. They loved getting to know them. And they thought they were so lucky. They were always telling me they were blessed. They were grateful that they had this chance. Most of them hadn't planned to go into long-term care. Most of them sort of had a different goal for life and they'd stumbled onto it one way or another. And they were grateful. They felt what a lucky turn their lives had taken that they were able to work in these places. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. I would never have expected that kind of an attitude from nursing home employees of all people. And it went from there. Uh, being in their environment and working with them and working alongside them absolutely changed my opinion, certainly about nursing homes, but also about what it takes to be happy. And it ultimately changed my personal life as well. That is, that's big. And so speaking of big, um, the big idea you lay out in the book is the shift. Tell us about what the shift is all about. The shift is about changing from seeing people as objects to seeing them as people. And that and I don't mean that anybody looks around at their neighbors and their coworkers and actually thinks they're an object. Often as we as we go through our lives and we sort of engage in our relationships, very often we have sort of automatic knee-jerk reactions to other people that are more like the way we react to objects than the way we ought to react to real people. So let me just explain this. If I have an actual object like a pen, it comes from the factory and it exists for me, for the consumer to use. That's what it's for. And if it doesn't produce ink, if it doesn't write smoothly, then, you know, I'm going to shake it. I'm going to lick it, you know, to make it do the thing it's supposed to do because it's just a you Are you really going to lick it? (laughs) (laughs) Really? I have so many pens and I don't know why, because it never works. It never works. It never works. Don't Don't do that. I just met you, but I I don't want you to do that, okay? You can do anything but lick it. I will not lick it from now on. But the shaking, the shaking shaking actually sometimes works, right? (laughs) But what I don't do, I mean, I don't lick them anymore. But also what I don't do is I don't talk to the pen and say, what's going on, pen? How are you feeling today? Are you sad? Is that why you're not producing? You know, because it is just an object. It doesn't have an internal life. It doesn't have feelings. It doesn't have reasons. And often we find ourselves treating other people the same same way. So for example, if I'm driving down the highway and somebody speeds too fast and they kind of cut me off, my automatic thought is what a jerk, what a nasty person, what an idiot. You know, I just think about how bad they are because what they've done is interfered with my life. And I don't think about what reasons they might have. I don't think about feelings. It's just like, oh, you're a jerk. You're a bad pen. You're no good to me. But when we really see somebody the way they truly are. So like our best friends, our closest confidants, our close family members, our children, our grandma, the people that we just feel warm and close toward. You know, if I were driving down the highway and somebody was going fast and cut me off and I looked over and saw that it was, you know, my beloved best friend, I wouldn't think, oh, what a jerk. I'd think, oh my gosh, what's going on? What has happened in her life to make her drive this way, there must be some sort of an emergency. Because in that case, her internal life and her reasons matter to me. So when I see a person as a person, what that means is their internal motivations, their reasons for their behavior matter to me. And I see them first. When I see somebody as an object, I just see what they've done that bothers me. All I see is how their behavior is interfering with the stuff I'm trying to do. And I don't give any thought to why they're doing it and what rational and understandable reasons they might have. Can you you imagine if we all did that just 5% more? 
oh, I know. Just and 5%. Fact, we don't need to do even, it 10%, you know? Yeah. Nobody has to be perfect, but just a little bit more of thinking about what's going on with people would make such a tremendous difference. And we just so rarely do. We just get caught in this habit of seeing people like just the flat surface of them, just how they bother me and not going any deeper. And the shift, the whole book was written to show how we can shift out of that mindset where the only thing I really care about is myself and how things are affecting me into a mindset where we're open to what's going on with other people. And that's the big idea. You met many different employees who had amazing dedication to their patients, as you mentioned, and their coworkers. I like to talk a little bit more about the culture here. Tell us a few stories of how you felt the culture from these people. Oh, it was crazy. So I have to tell you and and your listeners, I had never experienced anything like this. When I first met that first nurse, Lauren, I thought, wow, she's amazing. But I kept finding people like that. And then I kept finding environments where everybody seemed to be like that. And I would walk down the halls of these buildings. You know, just just a quick side note. Working in long-term care is a very, very difficult job. And in places where they don't sort of nurture the culture like this, you can find lots of burnout. And it's very easy for the different team members and the different departments to end up sort of fighting with each other because it's a it's a business where margins are very, very tight. It, it's It's hard to make money unless you're very, very careful and diligent on every one of a thousand different elements. And so there's kind of a lot of stress involved. And so there's room for people to be very angry with each other and to be blaming each other and to argue and to nitpick. And I I saw environments like that because the industry is so difficult. But in these places where they fostered this, this idea of seeing people as people and when they encouraged it in their staff, people were so kind to one another. And I would walk in and I would usually wear scrubs. It wasn't obvious that I was writing a book and that I was, you know, writing things down and recording stuff. Like they didn't know from looking at me that they might show up in a book someday. I just looked like a visitor and everybody would say hi to me. Just, hi, how are you doing? Can I help you with anything? Just out of friendliness and people who would, you know, who were in the middle of um, changing a bed or something, if they saw me walk by, would smile. And I would talk to talk to them in groups. And we'd have these conversations where they would end up in this conflict, fighting with each other about which one of them was the most giving and the most devoted to the patients. Oh, you are. Oh, no, no. It's you. Don't you remember when you did that for this guy? Oh, no, no. Don't you remember when you did this for her? And you would, you know, one up each other in yeah. the other person being better. It was like being wrapped in a warm hug. It was so invigorating to be in an environment where everybody really cared about everybody else. This strikes me, and everything's about context, right? It's yeah. about w- what you've experienced, Kimberly, in your own life and how you react. But this really strikes me as this might be the first time you've ever experienced that. Is that true? No, I don't think it's true. But it had been a long time. It right. had been a lot of years. Right. And, you know, when I was originally working for the Arbinger Institute, and that had been years and years and years ago. I saw a lot of that there. But I'll tell you what, people are just people. And I, you know, I went on with my life. I was doing other stuff. I lived, I mean, I lived in Manhattan. And that. <laughs> well, I was just, I, can I, I it, and that may be why, dot, yeah. dot, dot. <laughs> right. You weren't really used to that. I mean, I no. noticed it being from, I'm, I'm from, you know, Fairfield County outside of Manhattan. So you know, spent a lot of time in that city growing up and I still do. And, you know, when I compare that city to other cities, even Denver, where I just were, people were just friendlier. Like they were literally like just taking their time and maybe wanted to know a little bit more about me, which I found. And and so I'm having that same reaction that you are like, it's a little bit of a refreshing surprise when that happens. It really is. And that just coupled with the environment that I was finding it in too. I, when I was young, I had lived in the Midwest, too. So I kind of knew that there were yeah. areas of the cult of the country that were friendlier in general. But, you know, but I wasn't in the Midwest. I was in San Diego. I was in yeah. L.A. I was in Inglewood. <laughs> you know, I was in places that, that weren't known for their friendliness. And I was in nursing homes, which, you know, nobody... I don't think anybody in the country sits and thinks, what are the most friendly places? I bet nursing homes. You know, nobody yeah. thinks of that. So, so for lots of reasons, the contrasts seem very 
Yeah, strength. no, absolutely. Let's talk about the effects of running an organization this way, because I know that there's a lot of organizations out there right now that want some of this and they want to know how to make that work, right? Talk to us about yeah. some examples here of leadership. This is what we're really talking about, right? You know, I think the very, very first key for leaders is the leaders have to do this too. This is not something you can say, hey, you guys, oh, down lower on the totem pole. You guys need to see each other as people. That's never going to work. For one thing, it's it's insulting to the people who like really do the work and that really run the business, the ones who are day to day changing patients and dealing with the public and making the product that actually happens. You know, the people who are on the ground floor of any enterprise deserve respect from their leaders. They are, though. I mean, look. I don't care who you are. If you're the manager, if you're an executive, you don't have a job if the people on the ground floor aren't doing what they're supposed to do. If they're not willing to take calls, if they're not willing to to do the work, then you have nothing. And so many leaders fail to recognize that. They tend to think, and here we are talking about seeing people as objects again. They tend to think, well, I'm the executive. I'm the CEO. I've got the MBA. I'm the one who's worked up into upper management. So I'm smart. And now I just have to tell all these dumb people how to do it. Because if they were really smart people, they'd be executives too. So clearly I have, you know, more intelligence and more insight than they have. And you see so often in businesses that the leaders have that kind of an attitude. And I think this is why so many things, so many initiatives, you know, like motivational initiatives and empowerment initiatives and things fail to work is because the people who are receiving the initiative, they know that their boss really doesn't care about them as a person. So in this company, the leadership was really, really devoted to treating the employees as people and getting to know them. So at the very top levels, the the leadership executive team, they, so here's just one example. One year, they were in the middle of sort of the big yearly gathering where they put, you know, all the executives, even those who worked in different places from different regions of the company, all came together for this big meeting. And a nearby facility had had a flood. And, you know, so all the residents had to be moved out. There were no lights. It was a big crisis for this local facility in the same city where they were having their big meeting. Well, the executives heard about this and they canceled their meeting and they all put on their boots and yeah. strapped on headlights and went and and moved beds and held flashlights and mops and got this done. Yeah. Because they didn't think they were any better than the other people. They just thought, oh, my gosh, there's trouble here. They need help. Let's go in and help them. And then at the sort of more local level, each individual manager or administrator of an individual facility, their their requirement when they first start in as a leader of a new building, they're required to spend the first about 30 days, depending on the size of the facility, doing nothing except getting to know the people who work there. They're supposed to learn everybody's names, even the night. Beautiful. Shift. That is, and, that's beautiful. Yeah. That is music to my ears. Isn't it fabulous? They yep. have to meet the people who work in the laundry. They have to meet the housekeepers. They have to meet everybody and learn their names and get to know them and hear from them and learn about their lives. You know, they can't just sit in their office and look at a spreadsheet and memorize their faces. They have to talk to them individually and get to know them. So, So you have, you can just imagine the power that has on a facility, you know, where the people are all all working together to take care of their patients and a new boss comes in and that's always scary. And there's nothing more sort of infuriating and insulting than when the new boss comes in and she knows everything and she snaps her fingers and she goes around to tell you you're doing this wrong and him he's doing that wrong and she she needs to be better at this and just sort of spread dissatisfaction because as an employee you're thinking how do you know like you haven't been here you with your fancy shoes how are you going to tell me Mm -hmm. how to make a bed how are you going to tell me how to fold towels you know it's just it's insulting and I think the heart of that comes from when a leader acts that way as employees we feel we can just tell I'm just an object to her like all I am Mm -hmm. is the person who answers call light. She doesn't care about me. She doesn't care about my insight. She doesn't care about what I've learned over years and years on the job. She's just in it for herself. 
And then how how can I get on board that train? <laughs> I can't. <You> know? <laughs> I think a lot so of people I- need to be on that train right now. And it really is. It's about paying attention to people and asking yes. questions and being just being interested. I mean, it yeah. seems so simple, yet so many of us aren't doing that um, on, on a daily basis. Oh, I so, know. Do you ask your employees about their lives? Do you know how many children they have? Do you know where they came yeah. from? Do you know what I mean, their dream is? I don't think, you know, probably you don't. And they know, your employees know that you don't care about them. Yeah. They know it and, yeah. and it affects how they work. Yeah. And not everybody's cut out to be a leader. I mean, I think in order to be a leader, you should be interested in people. I think you wake up every morning going, I, I want to know more about you because that just is fascinating. But, you know, again, pie yeah. in the sky, we can start small. Not everybody yeah. needs to do that, right? Again, it's that 5%. If we each just do that 5% more, what is going to be the outcome? So listen, speaking of case studies and interesting things, what message do you have for leaders about how to make work better? Okay, let's let's use some data if we can, no matter what kind of organizations people have. Okay, well, first of all, it's what we've been talking about. You you have people involved. If you have employees, if you have an organization, then that means you have people involved. And to the extent that as a leader, you're seeing them as objects, that's unfortunate in lots of ways. They don't like it. You don't get to learn about them. But even aside from that, if you're treating people as objects, the fact is they aren't objects. Like your employees do not exist to just to do the job. Like they have their own backstories. They have their own perspectives. They have a lot of uh, background and hopes and dreams and fears and insights. And if you see that person as just an object, you're you're missing out on all of that stuff. I mean, you can't possibly be an effective leader if you simply don't know what's going on with the people. So I have a story of a, a man named Aaron who is a leader and he his facility developed a customer service problem where they just weren't, I mean, the, the healthcare was fine, everybody was safe, but, but the nurses were sort of being unfriendly and family members who came to visit were unhappy. And so he gathered them to lecture them and tell them how to do better and tell them what good customer service should look like and so on. But as he was delivering this you know, speech to them, he looked out and realized that he didn't know about half of their names, didn't even know their names, couldn't greet them by name. And the ones whose names he knew, he didn't know anything about them at all. And so he stopped what he was doing, sent them all back to work. They were bored anyway, and got to know these nurses over the next couple of weeks and learned about them and asked them about their work and asked them about their lives. And what he was trying to do was he wanted to figure out what was going on in their work, what was difficult in their job that made it so that they weren't providing good customer service because they had a reason. They're human beings. They weren't just bad objects who didn't produce customer service. They weren't just bad pens. You know, they were human beings. And if they had suddenly stopped being nice to family members, there was a reason for that. And so he wanted to figure out the reason. So he got to know them and spent time with them. And then the customer service problem went away. It just disappeared without him really addressing it directly at all. And it turned out that one of the reasons they were sort of feeling less friendly and and acting less friendly was simply because they were feeling like they were objects, like they were not important to their administrator. It's a small business and feeling like the boss doesn't care and the boss doesn't know me and the boss doesn't care about what's going on in my life just was demoralizing to them. And it bled out into the customer service. Yeah, no, it's about seeing people as people. There's no question. In your research, what surprised you most? There were so many surprises, Megan. (laughs) I was just, I think what surprised me most was seeing that this thing that I'm talking about, that the the powerful impact of seeing people as people, to a certain extent, you kind of might expect that from nurses and caregivers. You know, these are people who go into nursing instead of some other field. And that's usually because they, they, uh, they care, you know, they're giving sorts of people, they're caring kind of people. And so you'd kind of expect to see this, this effect among them. What was most surprising for me was when I saw this effect in people who were not nurses, people who were in housekeeping or in the kitchen. So I have to tell you about Jason. He was this guy in the most out of the way nursing home. It was a tiny little town out in the middle of nowhere by Moab. I mean, it's very beautiful, but there's nothing there except these big red rock canyons. I was going to say, I, I actually mountain biked there and it's Did awesome. You? Yeah. Oh, 
Amazing. It's a great it's spot. Amazing. Listeners, if you've seen pictures, mm-hmm. it's better in real it's life. Real. That it's is really real. Amazing. It's astonishing. I just love the area. But there's it's not exactly a booming metropolis. It's the the towns there are very, very small. And so there was this tiny little nursing home. And it was old, like the building was old. So they had those old floors, like in um like in old elementary schools, if you know what I'm talking about, where you have to have this big polishing machine that mm-hmm. goes across the floor. You know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking. Yes. I have fond memories of that. I remember those machines. Remember those? I, yeah. And I hadn't seen one in so long until I went to this nursing home where it was still in use. And there was this guy named Jason and he was on the housekeeping staff, I believe. And his job was just to push that floor machine. Like that was it. Because it takes so long to polish all the floors in the building that that was, that was his job description. He pushed the floor machine. And he was a single guy, no family. He, um, he looked sort of weathered, like he'd had a hard life maybe. And I stopped and talked to him about his job. And he, he told me that he had friends, friends in the community who all had similar lower skill type of jobs like he had. And for them, their job was like the thing they had to do from Monday to Friday so that they could get to the weekend and have fun. And that was what they lived for was the weekend. But for him, he loved his job so much that for him, the weekend was this thing he had to get through until yeah. he could get to work on Monday and be with his family. And he was this amazing this amazing guy who who loved his coworkers and he loved the residents. So even though he wasn't a nurse, he was just hired to do the floor machine. Mm-hmm. He would answer call lights and he would bring blankets and he'd fill up water. He he just really did see everybody as a person and he got to know everyone. And that that kind of thing to me was such a shock because he wasn't, you know, somebody who thought, oh, I should I want to be a nurse because I want to take care of people. It wasn't like that at all. Anybody, no matter what their job, no matter what their background, no matter what they've been through, has the opportunity and the ability to see the people around them as people. It's not limited to a certain personality type. It's not limited to nurses. It's just anybody can do it. This is a choice we get to make. Am I going to just see people like objects? They're just broken pens and all I care about is how they bother me. Or am I going to take the time to pay attention, ask questions, and learn about what's really going in, on inside this other human being. Well, thank you for sharing these stories because I think it's the stories that really bring this idea to life where we actually see this happening. Like, it's great to know, right? So yeah. tell us, we're almost at the end here. What are you working on next? I'm working on another book about the same ideas, but this one will be, and it'll be full of stories too. I I agree with you. I think the story is the most powerful thing. There are dozens and dozens of them in in the shift and and I'm looking for more. But this one will be a little bit more focused on sort of the scientific evidence because other fields of study have have found um, lots of evidence that this is that this is real, that this effect is really true and that it really changes how people interact with one another. Kimberly, thanks for stopping by. This has been uh, really eye opening. No Thank pun you. intended. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'd be really grateful if you took a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes. It helps other people find our show. If you know someone who would enjoy listening, please share it with them. You can learn more about the future of work at talentculture.com.